So I thought it would be a really fun business to run. And that was probably my number one thing is I'm a big believer that if you want to be in the top percent, top 1% of anything you do, art, music, business, sports, you have to love it. Welcome to Two Sided, the Marketplace Podcast, brought to you by Share Tribe. Hello and welcome. I'm Sure TMO at Share Tribe, and I am your host. I should perhaps say uh, welcome back to the loyal listeners, as the podcast has had a summer break. I do hope some of you checked out our other podcast during the break, the Marketplace Academy podcast. Uh, it had a great series of marketplace funding, which I think was tremendously valuable for any marketplace founder looking to fund their business. So if you haven't checked it out yet, go and check it out. But let's kick off the second part of the season. We have another awesome episode where I am joined by Andrew Gesdecki from MicroAcquire, which is a marketplace for buying and selling online businesses. Again, one of those marketplace ideas that seem obvious in retrospect, but I had never thought of. A very compelling marketplace business case, high ticket items, extremely fragmented markets, Loads of potential trust and regulation challenges, as you can imagine. So I was very excited about this interview. Andrew is a so-called serial entrepreneur, and you can tell that from his story. To me, there was something about the way Andrew went about things when founding MicroAcquire that I just have not come across that much yet in the podcast. Now, I don't think we've only had first time entrepreneurs, but I think most of the guests have been. And just listening to Andrew's story, to me, it just shows that once you've founded and, of course, sold a few companies, you gain some very useful experience and a slightly different perspective. Also worth highlighting, prior to founding MicroAcquire, Andrew actually built a podcast studio rental marketplace using nothing other than ShareTribe. I just want to mention this because, of course, we're very proud of that. It was very excited for us at ShareTribe to hear a seasoned entrepreneur getting value out of ShareTribe. But I'm also mentioning it for all the ShareTribe users that are listening to this podcast, you're in good company. Now, usually in this intro, I list a few highlights, but for this one, I would recommend to just listen to Andrew's story and hear how an experienced entrepreneur like Andrew tackles a new marketplace business. Here's my interview with Andrew Gazdecki of MicroAcquire. Hi, Andrew. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Short. Super, super excited to be chatting with you, all things uh, marketplaces. Yeah, I'm very excited. Well, I followed MicroAcquire for quite a bit now. I've been you making a lot of noise in the startup and SaaS business, so I knew of you, but I had no idea. You had used ShareTrip in the past and you mentioned something, so I'm really glad we hooked up. But before we go into all of those things, we usually like to set the stage a little bit and like introduce the people who are talking because I have heard of you, but... Many people have also not heard of you. So could you tell us a little bit what you did before you started MicroAcquire? Man, how much how much time we got? You want the one minute version, two, five? We can do uh if you have a five minute version, that would be perfect. Okay. Uh yeah. My name's uh Andrew Gazdecki. I've kind of been a entrepreneur my whole life, I would say. I was kind of that weird kid in high school with the eBay store, even though you needed to be eighteen. I figured out a way to get in and just fell in love with business early and just I've always loved building stuff online and built a job board in college, built a SaaS company. I sold the job board to build a SaaS company in college, um, exited that business when I was 29, then started a crypto company for some reason. And the purpose of that company was we were trying to speed up times on the Ethereum blockchain. This was in like 2018 and the, I saw the first big crypto crash and now we have another big crypto crash, a very similar uh, as you've been through one. And now I'm at MicroQuire. So MicroQuire is a startup acquisition marketplace and we help mainly bootstrap founders or just any sort of online software company generally below 20 million in value sell. And the problem that we're trying to solve is when you have a company that isn't of scale, let's say over 50 to 100 million, typically you work with an investment banker, they charge a huge fee. I went through that at Business Apps or 
you know, you'd sell to a strategic, but a strategic buyer would typically only be interested once you're at scale. And so there's just millions of these small startups being created, but the only way to really sell them is if someone approaches you or if you work with a business broker and they can take as much as 10 to 15%, which is a lot. And so, yeah, so I looked at that and I looked at the market as I was exiting altcoin my second startup or i have like five startups but i only i only count like three the the incorporated ones if you will and i was looking to buy a SaaS company and i just couldn't find anything that appealed to me or i felt was of quality and then i felt the whole market could use some innovation in terms of making acquisitions easier and you know acquisitions is such a mysterious thing for so many founders and the first thing that happened when I sold business apps was I had like 10 friends call me and be like, how'd you find the buyer? Like, how did you go through due diligence? And it just kind of dawned on me that, you know, arguably the most important part of the founder's journey is the exit. And there's books, there's, you know, podcasts, everything on marketing, fundraising, sales, product development, but nothing on had actually exit your business. On the final part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I thought there was a huge void in the market and, you know, large market, low MPS, lack of innovation. So I thought, and I, and I love startups. I'm like a huge startup nerd. I mean, I love Share Tribe. I've read your whole book. I built a marketplace previously on Share Tribe. I should also add that. So in between Altcoin and MicroAcquire, because I always like to build stuff where I'm, I feel kind of uncomfortable, if you will. Like I built a job board and then I built a SaaS company. And the next logical thing you'd think to do is start another SaaS. But no, I started a crypto company and then now I'm building a marketplace. I just love different business models and studying them. And we can talk about this in more detail, but I built a, a podcast rental marketplace where there's like studios where you can, you know, rent a professional studio to record like an in-person podcast. And so I just built that using share tribe and then actually sold it on microwire as one of the first business really i could have actually used that now because like i'm i'm actually on holiday and but we managed to book this and i'm now actually borrowing the office of my friend and i was looking like man are there like podcast studios around and it's like it would be impossible to find to be honest so i could have used that it's still up it's called podcastrental.com and it's still on share drive all right all right, I'm going to try. I didn't even know that. Yeah, that's cool. So you said you sold multiple companies. So did the idea dawn on you then already that like, hey, you know, this could be a thing or did you just, did you put it together later when you're like, because you're right, like what you said, like rings totally true. Like there's like a million books on marketing, starting, whatever, lean startup, whatever, term sheets you can download, but there's nothing about like, at least I've never come across anything of that scale about the exit. So, so at what point did you really get the idea? Yeah, I would say it was always kind of in the back of my mind in terms of just an area that brought together all people that were interested in, like who buys startups? Like that's the first question. You know, you have financial buyers that would be private equity groups, high net worth individuals, family offices. There's a number of different, sometimes even VC firms for bolt-ons for their portfolio companies, startups by other startups, both venture backed and bootstrapped and just getting everybody in one area where everything is basically standardized. All listings are anonymous because if you're putting your company up for sale, the last thing you want to have happen is your employees find out too early or your customers. And this, when I remember, I remember when I told my team at business apps that we were being acquired, you know, you get questions from, am I becoming a millionaire? Or a billionaire? Yeah. Or am I getting fired? Like it, it's just a crazy wave of emotions. And so, you know, you really only want to kind of, you know, share that information, in my opinion, when it feels like it's really going to happen. Otherwise, you kind of leave this sort of weird or staying of, are you going to sell the company next month? Like, what's going to happen? Like, yeah. You know, are you leaving money on the table? Do you get a right valuation? Those kind of things. Yeah. So, so basically what I did at the very beginning was I wrote down what I did not want to do, or I guess put it a different way, things that would bring me like positive energy. And so the, the one at the top was I wanted to serve startup founders, 
because I, I'm again, I, I'm like a startup nerd. I could probably name like, I, I don't know. I, I know a lot about different startups, product releases. I'm always just, you know, studying their marketing tactics, how they're growing, just testing other products for fun. So I knew, and I think that's just a, a big important item for every founder to really figure out because the customer that you serve is someone you're going to be talking to a lot for potentially over a decade. So if you hate going to the dentist and you make a world changing CRM for dentists, but you don't like dentists, it's going to be a hard decade yeah. for you. And maybe that's not the best answer, but yeah, but I get what you mean. Yeah. Like how is that with crypto? I mean, like that's a rough market to deal with, I guess. That was a learning. Yeah. That, so that was a good learning with Allcoin was, you know, that customer base is so it's just a wild market. And also the first application of what we were developing was basically like a decentralized coin base. So you can trade different tokens. And we got to a point where we were making progress and I kind of made the call where, you know, to really scale the company, we would need more capital. And then two, I could never go to sleep at night knowing that I have like this cryptocurrency because they get hacked all the time. It's literally like, it is like there's it's a bank vault that's easily hacked. And so I just kind of had a hard talk with my team like and it's a very technical project. I'm not a technical co-founder. So that adds to my list. I like the benefits of a marketplace business model because really, you know, you definitely want to innovate. But the, the value is in the supply and um, the demand on both sides. I mean, if you look at Craigslist, I mean, that's probably a good example of how, how low tech a marketplace can be. And then. The three was really having a unique insight. And so, you know, when I when I looked at that, acquisitions kind of popped up in my head just because I had been through two of them. I've been on the sidelines of, of a few of them just from, you know, angel investing and stuff like that. So I thought it would be a really fun business to run. And that was probably my number one thing is I'm a big believer that if you want to be in the top percent, top 1% of anything you do, art, music, business, sports you have to love it like you have to enjoy like the daily building you have to enjoy doing the stuff that isn't fun but moves the business forward every single day and find a way to make it fun and if you get the things right like your customer your business model in a market that you truly enjoy that increases your odds of success in my opinion because it's 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 really hard to compete with the founder where it's work to you, but it's fun to them. So they're going to be putting in, you know, 130% because they like, they're yeah. just playing like they're it's like a game. Yeah. It's like they're <laughs> playing their favorite video game. Yeah. Their favorite video game and you're, and you're, you're at work. So that was kind of the principles I, I put together and I, I put a lot of thought in my third startup. Again, I, there's been others like failures and stuff like that, but you know, I wanted to really think through this one because I felt I kind of rushed in all coin just because crypto was booming. And I was like, oh, this is the next wave. You know, mo mobile was a paradigm shift in tech, crypto, blockchain, I think. So there's a lot of potential paradigm shift. So I rushed into that and I rushed into business apps, but that worked out really well. I'm, I'm really grateful for that outcome. But the point I'm trying to make is uh, I think a lot of founders should just put a lot of thought into the businesses they start because you might be running it for you know many many years if not decades yeah so you had that list you said like i like the audience what was the second thing like the, the third thing was like a unique insight and then what was the second thing a business model not a business model yeah so you got a two-sided marketplace so for micro acquire on the on the supply side we have uh, businesses right like SaaS businesses any online business and then demand side you already sketched that a little bit investment banks, private equity, or no, actually not investment banks, right? What did you say? Like private equity? I can go through. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, let's let's draw it out a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So on the supply side, we mainly focus on profitable SaaS companies. That would probably account for, I would say, probably 60% of the listings and the acquisitions we see. Then we also focus on e-commerce, newsletters. We also, you can buy marketplaces on our marketplace We've expanded into some other categories, but really just the definition is a profitable software company. And then on the demand side, we work with, you know, multi-billion dollar private equity funds, public companies, venture-backed startups, 
if you want to call them startups, because after a certain size, what is a startup anymore? Bootstrap startups, roll up plays. Those are people that have raised a fund to specifically acquire a certain type of startup and create a portfolio of them. A good example of that would be Shopify apps, aggregators like Thrasio, kind of, you know, a wide variety. And then also first time buyers too. So people that maybe are really good at marketing and they want to build a company, but they don't have an idea or they're not technical or, or whatever it may be. So, you know, on microcore, you can buy a startup for as little as, you know, 10,000 all the way up to, you know, 20 million. And so, and that's everything in between. What you're really buying is you're buying product market fit. So you're buying a startup that is working. It has some customers. It's got a little bit of a spark. Maybe it's on fire. And those are some of the bigger ones, but that can save you two years of time because, you know, first you think of an idea, like this is the typical way of building a startup. Think of an idea, you know, chase around customers for feedback, iterate, 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 find product market fit, get, and then you got to go find customers and you get some and stuff like that. It's hard, you know, <laughs> creating startups is not easy. And so. And not everyone's a builder, right? Like, I mean, some, like some people are like scalers, optimizers, other people are like builders and then they lose interest. So, so I guess the first group is maybe a great potential buyer also, right? Like, yeah, the, the two main reasons that I see entrepreneurs selling their businesses is either they've started working on a new project. Like one of my favorite stories, and this person is an investor now, he had a side project called Median and, or it was his full-time startup. And it was like a, Think of like you land on a web page and a live chat box pops up and you're like, I have no idea how to use this product. What do I do? And instead of saying like, okay, hey, click this, you can actually virtually log into their computer and just click that. And like, it's like interactive Zoom inside of a web. It's a great product. But he had started working on a, a different startup with another co-founder that is doing really well. It's, I think, going to be a very large company. It's called a uh, workshop and they sold that company for uh, let's call it half a million within 30 days. And they use that funding to fund their new business. And now the buyer of that company is median is trying to grow that business to, you know, a couple million in revenue. And he's perfectly happy with that. So microcars, it has a lot of cool stories like that, where we allow, you know, builders to exit their business instead of just, kind of saying like, oh, I'm moving on to the next thing. They're able to, you know, build something, focus on their specialty, keep having fun, sell it, use the proceeds towards their next project. And then the business is now in the hands of someone who can potentially take it farther or, you know, breathe in some extra new energy into it. So. Yeah. And like the last couple of years, like, I don't know how much, for example, you see no code playing a role in that, but like you see this really this rise of these like, you know, micro sauce, right? Like a couple of these, these people that I follow on Twitter, like they built like um, a thing to resize a picture. You know what I mean? Like that's like some kind of online service that is super great for resizing pictures or like these maybe maximum, I don't know, some maybe 10, 50,000 MRR if you play it really well, but like, yeah. That's a, it's, it's a great yeah, business. That makes sense. Yeah. And that was a thesis I had around MicroQuire too, was, you know, there was going to be a rise of, you know, what you say, quote unquote, micro SaaS, because startups have been democratized where we have tools where you don't have to be technical to build a product. You know, it's so easy to find the customers these days if you are active on social or if you are in the right communities or if you niche it to a certain market. And so I felt there was going to be a lot more small software companies than just the outliers and the billion dollar companies, which is all you really hear about, which kind of can skew your view on what the reality of entrepreneurship and startup is. But like for every, you know, unicorn, there's 10,000, you know, profitable, smaller businesses. So um, that's the market that we want to serve. And also a part of micro choir is, you know, bringing like, you know, encouragement and support and recognition to people who are, you know, foregoing the venture path and building something, you know. Yeah. Could we go back a little bit? Like what was, the, because, you know, you've built multiple companies. So sometimes that means that people go really big the next time. What was the first version of micro choir like? Like, was it just you and a, a list of companies on a sheet of paper? Like what was the, you know, what's the very first time that you sort of consciously started working on it? Like, did you build something big? How small did you start? Could you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so for this one, I kind of over-engineered it, like as a MVP. I worked with an agency, and because the, th the thought process was, okay, so there's a huge trust element, and I borrowed a lot of, you know, parallels from Mint.com. For those that don't know, Mint.com was acquired by Intuit. It's like a banking software personal finance tool. And they focus heavily on trust and security and brand and design. And so I felt that, you know, in order to get founders to trust MicroWire as a legitimate platform, it needed to look and feel like it was a very high quality product. And so we focus and we still do to this day. It's one of our core principles is design and user experience. And so that was the start of it. But yeah, I mean, I launched it in January of 2020 and the initial go to market was just me. Like just, <laughs> I guess to summarize it, it was probably probably best described as just brute force. Like I, I had a cold email campaign running. I was taking calls with anyone who would listen. I was going on podcasts like this. I was doing all customer support. I would sit on live chat. I was also doing product management. I was, we would write a, or I would write a daily newsletter with all the new deals that came in the following day. Sorry to interrupt, but the actual product was already like quite smooth. But did you do some kind of validation before that, before you committed to building that thing? Like, how, you know, like, okay, you, you, you referred earlier that when you sold, uh, I think it was business apps, you mentioned that you had some friends call you so you know there's a need, but like, how do you, how did you figure out that the demand side existed? Like, how did you validate the idea before you contacted the agency and say, okay, this is what I want? Yeah, so the the best businesses, in my opinion, this goes against like conventional wisdom, but I always try to place a obvious bet to me that's not obvious to everybody now that will become obvious in the future. So I'll give you three examples of that. So business apps, right when the iPhone app came out, no one knew how to build mobile applications. And so I said, every business is going to want a mobile application, but no one knows how to do it. So I made an obvious bet to me because I was in college, everyone had iPhones, all the local bars wanted iPhones and restaurants to let their customers know when they had specials. So I saw that happening firsthand. So I had a unique insight. And then Allcoin, I made a non-obvious bet. I guess this one maybe isn't the best bet, but I, I still made it. But I felt that, you know, there's a lot of potential in blockchain, but it's really slow. And if we were able to bring, you know, essentially take it from dial up with, you know, the AOL, like, you know, so take it from that to broadband speed, it would help a lot of the applications. And so that was where our focus was. Very challenging technical problem that is still being worked on today. But with MicroQuire, I, you know, made a obvious bet to me that wasn't as obvious to others that there was going to be a trend of entrepreneurship through acquisition. I had started to hear about other people acquiring companies, so just regular people. And they had a portfolio of maybe 10 small companies generating, let's call it anywhere from $200,000 a year to a million a year. And it fascinated me. And I said, this is what people are going to be doing. And there needs to be a marketplace that, you know, really streamlines and standardizes and consolidates all of this into one area. And so that that was the bet that I made. So I did do some, you know, validation in terms of, you know, talking with buyers, talking with sellers and across the board it was like, yes, this is I want to start this. And there was also a previous attempt called Exit Round, which uh, we've since acquired. But. I studied all the mistakes that they made and I looked at what was going wrong. And then I looked at other marketplaces in the space and, you know, read all the, the reviews in terms of what was wrong and read a lot about scams and lack of customer support and just kind of, you know, anything goes almost kind of Craigslist style. So I, I validated it in another way in terms of looking at the landscape of the market and studying other options for selling your business and then correcting all the issues that people were complaining about and complaining about loudly, like screaming for another solution. So when I first launched MicroQuire, I just put it on product hunt one day and there was no plan behind it. It was just like, all right, let's 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 go ahead and launch this. I think it's ready. And it just exploded like a, like a bomb. It was product of the day. 
and then obviously you get the spike and then like it goes away after the next day so you're like oh bombing off like when i say a bombing off like it just goes off it doesn't the bomb doesn't keep going off but it was being shared by so many people because so many people i think it struck a chord within the startup community in terms of like yes we need something like this like i have like a business that i've been wanting to sell and you know this seems like a great option and Another key thing that we did was, you know, we didn't charge, we, we still don't charge commissions. So we were the first marketplace to come out and say, yeah, you can sell your business. So we monetize by charging buyers. So think of it like we are a Ferrari dealership where you can go in and look at all the cars. But if you want to know the owner who have additional questions, you want to have a conversation about buying that car you pay an annual subscription for access. And we're gonna charge commissions in the near future, but we wanna do that when we get to a point where we feel like we've added so much value into the acquisition process where people will willingly pay, because these are high ticket items. So it's really easy to take a 3% take or rake on you know, a $20 transaction, but when it's like a $2 million transaction, you gotta really earn that, so. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah, because I was going to throw in a disintermediation question at some point, but like you already answered it because you don't really you don't really have that problem. But of course, like thinking about two sided marketplace network effects interplays like transactions still is probably one of the best ways to monetize on that. So so eventually I'd imagine you, you want to do that. Yeah. And you want to just like because what are the when you say like what are the things that people were complaining about before your solution existed like i imagine like trust you know in the product like how do you make sure that that trust exists and how do you maintain that well the first thing is just ensuring that every listing is accurate and valid to avoid scams we've never had a single scam on microquire we've had some listings reported by customers where they'll be like this looks a little fishy and we'll review it and we'll you know, promptly take it down if it does look fishy. But we ID verify every seller. We ask for proof of ownership. You're able to connect your real financial metrics through Stripe or ProfitWell or Burr Metrics or any of the uh, yeah, billing yeah. systems. You can even connect Google Analytics. And then we do the same thing on the buy side where we ask for, you know, proof of funds. We ID verify them. And then we also ask them to verify their identity through LinkedIn. So as a seller, like when I was selling business apps, I did a ton of due diligence on the buyer. I really researched into them because the last thing you want to do is, you know, get to the ninth inning of an acquisition and then you find out the seller doesn't have the funds or not credible. And then also other marketplaces or other places you'd go to sell your business, you know, you don't have control over the process. So I wanted full control over selling my business. So I kind of just, you know, scratched my back in terms of, you know, how this marketplace should operate. But the disintermediation part, that's a tough word, is is leakage. Yeah, it, it's it, it's it's a hard one, especially for this, because we're selling assets that, you know, are more expensive than, you know, your home, you know, like unless you're you know extremely rich. Um, but so. Uh, what we've been you know building is like a guided acquisition process kind of in the similar vein that you know y combinator standardized a lot of early stage investing with the safe the simple agreement for future equity and so we have a letter of intent builder and then we have an asset agreement builder and then we have escrow integrated so we have this like flow that you can go through and that leads you straight to an acquisition and then we have a lot of resources and we also have a team that can help you, you know, guide you along the way to the right buyer. Yeah, because like from what I like interviewing many people for the podcast and like analyzing all other marketplaces, like the the fundamental thing always with this intermediation is just that you you need to own that rake, right? Like you need to add as much of that value to the actual transaction or to take it out again. So so I could like what you're saying makes total sense, like escrow, all the validation, like all that stuff that if you just, you know, if you just take the check, that's not, that's not enough for this kind of, these kind of tickets. Yeah. Like, we're, like, like legal dog creation, um, transferring assets. Um, yeah. Uh, we even allow you to find advisors within the marketplace. So if you need help in terms of, you know, accounting or legal or just an M&A advisor, M&A stands for mergers and acquis- basically a fancy term for 
an advisor to help you who has experience with acquisitions, you can hire those with the micro query. So we've been adding all these add on pieces and then probably Q4 will we'll start rolling out commissions marketplace wide. I'm going to throw in another of my favorite questions, which is always about like liquidity and I'm constraining the marketplace, right? Like if you have a marketplace operating, for example, in multiple geographies or in multiple categories, did you constrain micro acquire initially in any way? Like did you, for example, only take SaaS businesses or only SaaS businesses of a certain value or on the buyer side, did you only take PE firms or something like that? Did you do something? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So, that's the start. It was only SaaS companies. And then we naturally just saw a lot of e-commerce companies coming in, newsletters, even crypto companies, like I said, marketplaces. So we've created categories for all those types of businesses. But initially it was just SaaS. So all the messaging was just SaaS because there was no area to buy a quality SaaS company where you can see the actual performance and health of the business. What is the you know monthly recurring revenue? What is the customer acquisition cost? What is churn? And so we started with that. One other change that we've made as we've grown is we no longer list pre-revenue startups. So we want to be the marketplace that, again, you're buying product market fit, like a real active business, not a starter website or just a app that maybe is a clone script and uploaded onto a server. We want to sell you know, actual startups that have customers. Um, and so that's been a change that, that we've made to differentiate as well. But yeah, in the beginning, we went really, really narrow and really, really specific. And that was mainly bootstrap SaaS. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Can I ask, like, what was the first transaction you did on MicroAcquire? Like, do you have a good story? Or what was the first good story about, like, a company that got sold that you're like, oh, well, this is the moment where I felt like, oh, this is working. Yeah, that's a great question. So the first one I remember not so well, but I, I was in Hawaii. It was right before the, it was basically when the pandemic hit in March of 2020. And this person just said, cause there was a lot of me features that were missing. So when a listing would go live, we'd have no idea, or I would have no idea if anyone contacted the seller or reached out for additional information. We just hadn't built in all that functionality yet. And then I got an email from this individual saying he had like 30 offers on his company. And I was like, whoa, like now we can, you know, track that activity and kind of have a predictive score of like, you know, we have letter of intents that are created and then sent to buyers or excuse me, sellers and micro core. So we can kind of tell when a startup is on the verge of closing. But back then it was kind of like a black box. Like, again, I'm not technical, so I couldn't go into the back end servers and look or anything like that. But I'd say, you know, the moment I really was like, this is a special startup and one I want to spend, you know, a good amount of my time on is there was this individual in India and he had created a coding education platform that helped you pass interview tests for, you know, the FANG companies, the software engineering tests. And he was based in India. I like FANG, like uh, Google, Facebook, Apple. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Like the coding tests. I'm not, I'm not familiar with what those tests are like, but he sold it for, let's call it, you know, over a quarter million dollars and he was 23 in India. So he was just graduating college and he wrote me the most heartfelt email just saying like, he's paying off his debt. He's like buying his mom, like a house, like, and this is 250,000 to a 23 year old in India. So that goes a long ways. And so that's, that's when I was really like, you know, this, this is kind of bigger than me and, you know. Yeah, I love that. That's like, I don't know, like I'm a big fan of this like democratizing thing. Like I've always worked in like, like ShareTribe, for example, right? Like it's like democratizing access to building a marketplace and like other, many other startups that I work with have some, some concept like that, right? Like I worked for an app that democratized access to music education, right? So you can learn guitar on your phone. Like, and this is kind of the same thing, right? Like that, that person in India would probably have a really hard time selling that like the whole process to find a buyer so that's like yeah that's a terrific story about the buyers by the way so you, you told a little bit about like how you onboarded supply side right product con like that's I, i'd imagine at least like of course there's a lot of probably vc activity there as well but that's mostly frequented by makers did you have any tricks to get the buyer side on board or any strategies that work really well for you that you are willing to share i mean i don't have like 
I always say with marketing, there's no silver bullets. And what I mean by that is there's no like one thing that really worked. It was just consistency. And I think just telling the story of microquire and why it needs to exist intrigue a lot of people, both on the buy side and the sell side, because, you know, a buyer could also be a seller and a seller could also be a buyer. And so my, my marketing kind of appealed towards both if I'm guessing in the early days we're we're a little bit more you know data driven now in terms of how we acquire you know supply side and demand side but a lot of it just comes through referrals just through word of mouth of people who've either sold a business or bought a business or like the highest attribution that we have is just direct so people hearing about us talking about us i've heard some my this is a true story my son was at uh, swim lessons and my wife was telling another dad what I do. And he's like, Oh, microquire, I like I'm buying a company off of there right now. And I don't know who he is or what. So my point being is, you know, I think, you know, if if you if you really, really hit the nail on the and the and these market opportunities are very, very rare, is when it's just such a dying market need and no one really just understood how to position it correctly, how to really build that story so people get excited around it. You know, if you get all that correctly when you launch it, you know, it's really powerful. And I kept sharing that story over and over. So if I had to say one thing, I'm just going to go with just the story behind, you know, my my previous, you know, startup experience and applying all that learning to, you know, the story behind MicroQuire. And I think this story is what really resonated the most with both buyers and sellers. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and what you say is true, right? Like there's a high um, like symmetry between potential suppliers and demand people or like buyers and sellers. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing not, I'm totally going to plug this, but um, so I wrote a book about my experience bootstrapping business apps all the way from idea to exit, where I talk about how I built the company, how I found the buyer, what was going, what was it like going through the acquisition so it's definitely a good read if anyone's listening and they're wondering, you know, how do I build a startup? Yeah. Where can we get it? Amazon. Amazon. And it's called? Getting Acquired. Okay. I'll put a link on the podcast episode, like, uh, or on the episode page where people can get it. Yeah, that's really interesting. And actually, that might even remind me that, like, also what you said about the buying, like, the selling process not being documented. I'm just, like, going back, like, in my head, what we do with ShareDrop. And we tell people everything about, like, how to raise money, how to build, how to market, but not, like, how to sell, actually. So really good point like one last question was there anything that did not work out as expected that you're like oh i was thinking well of course there's always something that doesn't go out expected but what did not work out very well candidly i would say i mean we had a kind of a first world problem but initially the server infrastructure wasn't built that well so we had to do we lost like maybe three months doing a full rewrite uh to you know really speed up because there were so many users all of a sudden and no one was expecting this and so that was probably the biggest issue but i mean i didn't i didn't ab test the landing page the landing page from visitor to user sign up was sitting at around 60 percent for the longest time for about two years never ab tested it so we kind of just nailed the messaging and i think that goes back to just understanding the customer so well and just scratching my own itch and solving a problem that I had personally been through. So, I mean, I'd say things that... Or maybe like if I phrase it like, you know, anything you would have done differently so far. No, nothing. I mean, I, I just say <laughs> it's been a lot of work, but I've also had just so much fun. And I think, you know, I don't really view failures as failures. I view them just as opportunities to improve your lessons. So... Nothing really major comes to mind. I think if anything, we, we've had bugs, we've had server issues, but it's only made us better. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. All right. So very, very last question. What's the future for MicroQuire? Like you, you mentioned that you uh, expanded from profitable SaaS companies to marketplaces. What's next? Well, my goal for MicroQuire eventually is we want to help every type of business in the world transact on MicroQuire including, you know, HVAC businesses or restaurants or laundry mats, you name it. We want to help every type of business in the world. So, 
All right, let's end on that. Thanks a lot for your time, and Andrew. Do you want to actually now that you get the book? Maybe is there anything else you would like to plug? Follow me on Twitter. Go on Microquire, sign up, check it out. And if you have any you know questions, shoot me an email, andrewmicroquire.com. All right. Thanks a lot for your time, Andrew. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Two Sided, the Marketplace podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe. If you listen on iTunes, we'd also love for you to rate and give us a review. If you got inspired to build your own marketplace, go visit www.sharetribe.com. It's the fastest way to build a successful online marketplace business. Until next time.